everybody. Hi there, welcome back. I'm Larry. I'm Emily. And this is our channel, Planet and God, where uh, we try to uh, convey and grow with you in the Word of God. Uh, so, Emily, what are we doing today? So today we are in John chapter 10. John chapter, why are we in John chapter 10? We are reading through the Gospel of John. There you go. So if you started with us last week, uh, we are doing a chapter day Monday through Friday. We end on Christmas Day. If you are catching us in the middle and want to start afresh, go right ahead. All the videos are in the series, um, and then you can just follow along at your leisure. So, uh, Emily, you got any pre-thoughts before we get into John? No pre-thoughts. No. Um, you always have. The only pre-thought that I will give is that it reads like a continuation of chapter 9, but that's the only thing you're getting until we get into the chapter itself. Okay, so let's dive in. Okay, so the very opening is talking about how Jesus is the door and our shepherd. Yes, and it's, it, like I said at the beginning there, it reads very much like a continuation of chapter 9. It's unclear just by the context of who Jesus is speaking to, but there's one thought being that he's speaking to the Pharisees, because if you remember at the end of chapter 9, the Pharisees threw out this blind man, the man who was born blind, who Jesus healed, performing a uniquely messianic miracle. And so now Jesus finds the man. And so the thought is that Jesus finds the man outside of the synagogue where the Jewish leaders had just, you know, thrown him out. Probably DJ Jazzy Jeff style. <laughs> so this, I mean, this kind of, it kind of fits that thought. It fits because Jesus is now talking about being the good shepherd in contrast to the Pharisees who thought they were the true shepherd. So you kind of see that as we go through and in these verses, Jesus brings up thieves and robbers. And when he brings up thieves and robbers, he's speaking of the Pharisees who were the thieves and robbers because they claim to have authority. They stole, essentially they robbed the authority that the Mosaic law had and applied it to their oral law. They're, they essentially would elevate the oral law above the Mosaic law. So in turn, stealing away God's word and putting their own above it. Right. I mean, I just noticed that we see that Jesus saves, right? And we have freedom as his sheep to go in and out and find pasture. It, he basically, well, I'm kind of jumping down where he explains a little bit of what he was saying before, yeah. right? Because he, he goes over, it's like a parable, and then he explains that. Through... Because they don't, they don't understand right. what Jesus says. As he speaks, <laughs> right, verse 6, they don't understand. And then Jesus will then go on, he'll continue his parable, talking about how he is the door, and that uh, all the sheep know him and go through him, but the thieves and robbers essentially do the work of Satan. Yeah, so what I really loved about it is that you can see the love and the care that the shepherd has, right? Yeah. You can see the intimacy that he's trying to explain, I guess. Yeah, he is. He's trying to say that, and then he's, he is, he's essentially um, saying that all who come to him by faith will, as you say, find pastor, find the abundant life. That's that's what he's really getting at there. And then as the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. Right, which is a picture of yeah. Jesus dying on the cross. He's, he's speaking parabolically of his death on the cross. Mm -hmm. um, look at verse 16. I'm going to read it. John 10, 16 says, I have other sheep that do not come from this sheepfold. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice so that they will be one flock and one shepherd. 
And I thought this was really a fascinating verse because Jesus is referring mm -hmm. to the Gentiles. Yeah, I noted that too because I thought that was pretty important also. It is, yeah. He's talking about he, how he will unite Jewish and Gentile believers under one banner, him as the Messiah. Now, a lot of people, you know, today's day and age would say, you know, we've got hundreds of ethnic groups in the world. But in the Bible, there's only two major ethnic groups and a third that's kind of like a hybrid of the two. You've got Jews, Gentiles, and then the Samaritans. And if you know, the Samaritans are Jews that married Gentiles and had children. So mm -hmm. they're like, not really an ethnic, they're kind of, but they're not. But in the overall context of the Bible, you've got the two major ethnic groups. You're either a Gentile or a Jew. You're not, doesn't matter what color you are, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Right. So that is the universal nature of Jesus Christ and faith in him. It is for everyone who believes. That is so amazing. And, you know, what this this really thought brought my to uh, my brain was one of my favorite sections in the Bible, Isaiah 49, specifically at verse 6, which says this. You have God speaking to his servant, the Messiah, saying, it is too light a thing to be my servant to reestablish the tribe of Jacob's and restore the remnant of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations so that you can bring my deliverance to the remote regions of the earth. Right? That's just so, like, it prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was even born that he would establish this common faith for everyone. Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty amazing too. Yeah, and then um, at the end of this section, we see this division arising among the Jews, and this division will essentially lead to a final decision about what they're going to do with Jesus in chapter eleven. We'll get to that on Monday, but we see here this division arising in verses nineteen through twenty-one. It says this, another sharp division took place among the Jewish people because of these words. Many of them were saying, he, he is possessed by a demon and has lost his mind. Why do you listen to him? Others said, there is, these are not the words of someone possessed by a demon. A demon cannot cause the blind to see, can it? Right? You have this division. You've got a certain group of people that are believing the lie of the Pharisees that he's demonically possessed. And then another group that are like, but... He just did something that we've been told our whole lives would be uniquely messianic. Yeah, and you can see too what you were saying at the beginning that it flows from that chapter, right? Because otherwise, yeah. why would they respond about the eyes right. of the blind being opened? Yeah. If they hadn't just witnessed that. Exactly. So then we go further in and it kind of pauses because now we're at another feast. <laughs> yes, so the Feast of Dedication, do you know what the Feast of Dedication is? It is Hanukkah. It is, oh good job. And it's Christmas, right? We're good like timing. Headed, we're, 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 we're headed right, right for it. <laughs> so Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah also called? Do you know offhand by chance? The Feast of Dedication, I just said it. <laughs> no, there's another none for it. I, I can't remember. The Festival of Lights. Okay, yes. <laughs> the Festival of Lights. So just a little bit of backstory on this one because I thought this was this was cool. I did a little research on Hanukkah. Backstory here. So Hanukkah is it's a feast that is not mentioned in the Torah. So it's not in the Old Testament. If you have a, a, a regular Old Testament, it's not a mosaic feast, right? It's not mentioned in, in when all the other feasts are set up. However, the events that lead up to Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, when it was inaugurated, are recorded in the book of Daniel as prophecy. So the, here's the history of it. The, the Feast of Dedication is a feast celebrating the Maccabean victories in B.C. 165 and 164. So Judas Maccabeus drove out the Syrians rebuilt an altar and rededicated that altar to rededicated the temple to the Lord. If you want to read more about this, you've got to find an apocrypha and read 1 Maccabees chapter 4 verses 41 through 61. 
That is the historical context uh, behind this Feast of Lights. And it was essentially the last great deliverance for the Jewish people uh, that they would experience, right? That's why this is so significant. And I thought this was really cool. I'm going to quote Josephus in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. He comments on this about the festival. He says this, And from that time, that time to this, we celebrate this festival call and call it lights. I suppose the reason was because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us, and that thence was the name given to the festival. Right, so he's talking about how this festival, like it's so, it's it's was given to us because of what Judas Maccabeus did. He helped restore the temple worship. So that's a little bit of history on Hanukkah. It's pretty interesting. Yes, and so that get, brings us into this festival with uh, Jesus um, walking in Solomon's portico or porch area within the temple compound. When he goes in, he gets surrounded by the Jews, right? Yes, the leaders. Which I find <clears throat> odd because, well, not odd, maybe that's the wrong word, but... <laughs> no, odd's a well, good word. No, it's not like they were wanted to surround him because they were, like, fascinated by him. You no, know? they were surrounding him to accuse him of to being obscure. Him, and they wanted to, well, we see further in that they, you know, they try to stone him again. Yes, they do oh. later. They try to stone him again. They accuse him of being obscure, but then Jesus reminds them that he both told them with his words and with his actions who he is. Right? He's He's been telling them this whole time who he is. Right. And they just they refuse to believe. Him, they're like, well, why don't you just tell us, you know, who you are? Right. Even though, and then Jesus responds in saying, like, I've already basically done that, and yep. I've shown you not just in my words, but in, in my, my actions. actions. Yeah. Yeah. So. And then he tells them the reason why they're confused about this in verse 26. He says this, but you refuse to believe because you are not my sheep. Right? The whole reason that they refuse to believe, the whole reason they're confused is because they're not his sheep. They do not hear his voice. They do not believe in him. Yeah, and what an amazing thing that you, we have as his sheep, right? Yeah. He hears us, he knows us, and then we follow him. Yeah. You know, it uh, goes back to that intimacy and just having comfort in that. Right. So. And then we get, you know, verses 27 through 29, you're, we're back to that lesson of the shepherd, and the emphasis that Jesus brings in these verses is the fact that we cannot be snatched out of the Father, uh, Father's hand. Once we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are eternally secure. That, and you're not snatched out, you're there. Yeah, Pretty what great. a great place to be. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jesus moves in verse 30 from being obscure to very plainly clear. I and the Father are one. He can't get any more clear than that. And we see with how the Jews, Jewish leaders react, they understand him perfectly fine. Yeah. Because that's when they try to stone him. That's when they try <laughs> to stone him, right? Verse 32, Jesus said to them, I have shown you so many good deeds from the Father, for which of them are you going to stone me? Right? So they pick up these stones. Jesus is like, what, what did I do? Just tell me, and, and let's get this over with, right? They respond in verse 33, the Jewish leaders replied, we are not going to stone you for a good deed, but for blasphemy because you claim, are claiming to be God. All right? So they think that Jesus is blaspheming and then Jesus goes and he says some pretty weird things in verse 34. Yeah, so that, it didn't, I don't want to say it stumped me, but I was like, this is different. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'll read it. Jesus answered them. Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? So then he goes on and he, uh, well, I guess I could just read. 35, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? 
then I, Larry and I kind of talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't even know where that comes from because you know it comes from the scriptures. He clearly yep. says that. Go ahead. This is one thing that you have to know when you're reading the New Testament is that oftentimes the whoever's speaking or writing will write one verse down, but they make the assumption that you know the rest of the verses. They make the assumption that you know the context. Well, and the Jewish leaders definitely would know the context. Right. The Jewish leaders, the first century, the the recipients of John's letter, right, John's book, would know the context. And so that's the assumption that's being made. So when Jesus is saying, I said you are gods, he's only quoting one verse, but he wants you to have the whole thing in context. Just like in John chapter 1, when John opens up with in the beginning, he wants you to have the whole context of creation in mind. So here, he's referring to Psalm 82. And it's, with, it's the context of Psalm 82 that you need to have in mind in order to understand this verse. And so what Psalm 82 is talking about is it's talking about men who were given the role as judges over the nation of Israel. And in that role of judge, God delegates authority to them. And so they are called Elohim or gods because they have delegated authority. It would be like if, uh, so I ha I'm a manager, right? And if I go to one of the guys on my team and I say, hey, I'm giving you permission to sign my name off on this project. You have the authority of Larry to approve or deny this project. And stepping back and letting that guy on my team make the sole decision with my authority. So that's, that's what, what happened in Psalm 82. So the men are be called gods because they are acting uh, as instruments of the Lord's authority. It would just be like, again, my coworker is now called Larry because he is acting as an instrument of Larry's authority. The way Jesus' defense can be summarized is like this, that since these judges were called gods, how can it be blasphemy for Jesus to claim to be the son of God? Because everything he has said and done falls in line with the Father. He is acting under the Father's authority, and the proof is in the pudding with his miracles. And so then they attempt to seize him. However, Jesus escapes because his time is not yet. Yep, showing that he's in full control. He is in full control of everything that happens. Yep. We're at the last little tidbit of the chapter. Yep. Um, we see that Jesus goes back to the Jordan, which is where, uh, which it says in there, but um, it's where John the Baptist spent the bulk of his ministry. Baptizing, yeah. yeah. And he stayed there, so it doesn't say how long he stayed there, but he must. it must have been a while, a while. Yeah. because uh, 42 says that people believed in him there. Yes, <clears throat> and it just goes to show the testimony of John the Baptist, right? He did the role of the herald very well. He had pointed to the Messiah, and now people who follow John the Baptist are coming to the Messiah based on his testimony. Yeah, what I love... Um, about So verse 41, then many came to him, Jesus, and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And it makes me think about our testimony and how I want to be looked at as people seeing my testimony as being true in yeah. the eyes of the Lord. How do you point to the Lord? Right. It's a good way to examine ourselves and say, okay, are we, you know, being true to... Um, God's word, yeah. you know, and show and reflecting Jesus to other people. Exactly. So, examine yourself. How well are you reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? And then uh, refresh yourself over the weekend, and we will see you on Monday with chapter 11. <laughs> awesome. See right? you then. Yeah. Bye.